Hello, and welcome to this Beyond Clean virtual conference. The speakers for today's conference, the sponsors for today's conference, and the Beyond Clean team are all so excited that you're here. If this is your first time joining us for a Beyond Clean virtual event, I want to call your attention to a couple of event functions. All of the windows on your event screen are movable. You can shrink them, you can enlarge them, you can move them, whatever you need to do to create the event feel that works best for you. In the upper right corner is a resources tool. Download conference sponsor information and the resources and links that your speakers have provided for you, as well as instructions for obtaining your CE certificate for the day's event. On the bottom left, you will see a Q&A or question and answer tool. Any questions that you have for the speaker during each session can be submitted to them using this feature. Our speakers today will bring you a wealth of knowledge and all their information can be found in the speaker bio tool on the right side of your screen. Along the bottom are the icons for each of the windows as well. Clicking these will minimize and maximize each window. Included in that row is a group chat icon where you can interact with the speaker and the other attendees throughout this particular session. Simply click on it to engage. This will be an action-packed conference and there will be 15 minute breaks between each of the sessions. So feel free to grab a snack, check on the dogs or the kids, assemble a tray, do some jumping jacks, whatever you need to do before joining us again. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Lindsay Brown from the Beyond Clean team. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to the industry's first conference focused exclusively on dental reprocessing. Today's speakers will be providing you with critical information about ensuring that our teams, our departments, and our dental instruments and devices are properly cared for. It's Friday. Happy Friday. And I understand that you probably have a lot going on juggling so many things at home or at work. And so I just want to simply say thank you for being here, for being dedicated to education, for doing something that will help you grow as a healthcare professional. If you need to step away from any of these live sessions at any time throughout the day, not to worry. All seven sessions will be available on demand after the conference is complete. A quick reminder that this session will utilize a group live chat, and that live chat can be accessed by clicking the icon in the lower right side of your page with colorful thought bubbles on it. Hopefully it will encourage some colorful discussion. So sit back, relax, and get ready to enjoy an incredible day of learning. Our first speaker I am so excited to introduce you to, her name is Joyce Moore. And Joyce is an infection prevention and healthcare compliance consultant with over 20 years of experience in the dental industry. She is an experienced speaker, consultant, author, and clinical educator. And Joyce will talk about the four principles of infection control related to instrument processing and focus on understanding the different types Types of instrument cleaning methods for the dental space. So without further ado, I'm excited to kick off this brushing up on quality virtual conference and introduce you to Joyce Moore. Good morning for being here with us. I am so very excited to kick off uh, the Beyond Clean conference today. It's truly an honor. And um, as Lindsay said, I do have uh, a tie to the dental setting. I am a dental hygienist of almost 30 years. So uh, I, I am out there. And then I also uh, received my CRCST certification. So I sort of have feet in both medical and dental. But um, I am talking about critical details that impact instrument reprocessing and sterility today. Uh, I want to thank 3M Healthcare for sponsoring me, and you can see I, I do do some consulting uh, for uh, other companies and privately as well. Um, what I wanted to focus on today is is uh, a little bit of basics, but I will get into the into the weeds, so to speak. But first and foremost, we're going to discuss the four principles of infection control related to instrument processing. We're going to understand the different types of instrument cleaning methods, uh, explain the function of packaging instrument processing and storage, and then discuss how to properly store instruments to maintain sterility. So <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do is start with a poll. <clears throat> and I want to ask you, which one of these is not one of the four principles of infection control? <clears throat> Take action to stay healthy, 
manage contamination, avoid contact with blood and bodily fluids, and make objects safe for use. So I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to answer that. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> and make sure you're scrolling down and you're hitting submit in that lower right hand corner. And let's see what we got for results. Okay, so which one of these is not one of the four principles of infection control? 100% of you said take action to stay healthy. But that is actually um, not the one I would pick. And it's a little tricky. I was I was kind of sneaky with the wording. I was trying to make sure you were waking up this morning. But the answer was actually to uh, manage contamination. So instead of managing, when we talk about the four principles of infection control, we limit contamination. So give me just a minute to go through these. I like to start with the basics here because I think it really um, affects everything that we do and that we sometimes have to go back to basics to think about how we manage um, to work safely in our space. So uh, dental health care providers are absolutely routine, ex you know, routinely exposed to disease causing microorganisms and pathogens, um, whether it be from blood, saliva, body fluids. Um, so we've got to have a plan for infection control. And that often focuses on the management of our instruments. Um, so infection control really are just our basic principles and our set of steps that we're, we, we do to help reduce or prevent disease transmission. So taking action to stay healthy really makes a huge impact on reducing disease transmission. And that starts with, you know, immunizations. Um, we know hand hygiene is, you know, really one of the number one ways we can um, reduce disease. Um, Work restrictions. Uh, CDC does have guidance related to work restrictions, and your facility probably has a policy related to work restrictions. And what I mean is, is that if you have an illness, there is typically a set number of days, and of course, especially we're talking about COVID, where this guidance has changed a little. But, but for some of the uh, diseases that we've seen for a long time or viruses we've seen for a long time, there's guidance as to how long you should stay out of work. Um, limiting contamination talks about housekeeping, you know, what we're doing to keep the floors, walls, etc., reception area clean, uh, proper cleaning and disinfection, which is important because we want to make sure that we are using our disinfectants appropriately. We want to make sure we're using the correct chemical and the correct contact time. Um, proper waste disposal, and then dental unit water lines management, which is another story in itself. Um, making objects safe for use. This is where we're talking about our cleaning and our sterilization of items, and we're definitely going to delve into that. And then avoiding contact with blood and body fluids, um, which is which is managed through standard precautions, PPE, and then engineering and work practice controls. So I know this sort of takes a step back to look at the bigger issues here, um, but I think it is really important to, to get back to basics a little bit. So we're going to talk about personal protective equipment for a minute. Um, I know most of you are familiar with what that is, um, but I do have a question for you. And what I'm asking here is which type of PPE is typically worn in the instrument reprocessing area? And I looked at this and I thought I probably could have worded this a little bit better maybe, but, but I'm looking for one item that really should be used in that reprocessing area. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to, to uh, think on that. Um, again, scroll down and hit that submit. Uh, button down bottom. Okay, so I'm very curious as to see where where this where this answer lands. And ah, okay. So which type of PP is typically worn in the instrument processing area? This was a 50/50. Um, I've got exam gloves and I've got utility gloves. So. This is a really important point for me, um, and I will expand upon that momentarily. So when we talk about PPE, um, we are talking about what we need to do to be safe. And when we look to the guidance that's out there related to personal protective equipment, um, this can have to do with uh, guidance from OSHA, 
Um, it can be related to what the CDC has to say, and then um, your exposure plan that your office has. So when we talk about the employee being trained on use, training is the employee knowing what and when PPE is necessary, um, how to take it off, put it on, or donning and doffing, um, and how to wear it. So if there's limitations, employees need to know about that. They know how to they have to know how to care for it properly, maintain it, um, and appropriately dispose of it. So employers are really important in this, in this equation here because they are the ones that are providing the appropriate PPE. And it has to be in the right size. I mean, I'm a size medium glove. If all you give me is a small glove, that's not going to work. Um, in addition to that, you know, we need to um, be thinking about what we're wearing, and that has to do with our, our overgarments. So not necessarily our scrubs that we see underneath our clothes, but our overgarment, our gown, our lab coat. Um, and those, of course, need to be provided for us, whether or not they're disposable or they're cleaned within our, our, um, our space. Um, but they have to be repaired, replaced as necessary. And when it talks, when we talk about donning and doffing, the order of which we put our PPE on is really, really important. Um, a study showed not long ago that um, when people were putting on and taking off their PPE, there was a really high rate of cross contamination. So if you are touching your gown, with your contaminated gloves or you're touching your your safety eyewear with your gloves that's that's a high risk of cross contamination so ppe is to prevent that infectious contact and we should not be wearing this outside our clinical work area so osha talks to us about the bloodborne pathogen standard and that is uh, i will refer to it as bbp again it it goes back to what do our employers have to provide for us and what should we be using? And the only reason why I put this up really here, because I know you're wearing your gowns, your gloves, your 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 masks, your face shields, your eye protection, um, is because I thought it was very interesting that mouthpieces, resuscitation bags, and pocket masks also fit in here. But always look back to the OSHA guidance um, to see what they have to say. I mean, they're very clear on what we need to be doing out in practice to be safe. Um, protective eyewear and face shields. I have actually seen a number of eye injuries out in private practice. Um, and I like to point this out. And of course, now we're seeing the face shields out um, in public because of COVID. But um, we want to make sure that we are using protective eyewear and our face shields appropriately. So, you know, they need to be covering are you know from here to the sides of the face up to our eyebrows um, i believe we're going to be seeing some new guidance on eye wear coming down the pike so that's something that you'll be wanting to look for um, especially in the sterilization realm we're concerned about um, splatter and chemical injury while we're working in that area um, of course we want to clean and disinfect them and the big the big key here um, has to do with utility gloves. Utility gloves are an absolute must, and um, you'll hear me talk about them as I go through this presentation. But what we want to focus on with utility gloves um, is that everybody, again, gets the correct size for the user. So again, I'm not a small, I'm a medium. I have to have the correct size glove. And that I am going to take care of those gloves. If they are torn cut or punctured, they are going to need to be replaced. So I'll get off my soapbox soap as far as the basics go, but when you step into the sterilization area in dental, it may look very different than medical. And um, it is something that um, you will, how would I say this? Dentists are rarely trained 
uh, rarely have exposure to that. Um, some dental hygiene students, especially where I teach, are starting to see um, automated methods. So they may not know how to properly sterilize their instruments. So there's not that high, high, high level of knowledge that we have with, you know, with as compared to the medical realm, someone that has a certification. Um, so as far as best sterilization practices goes, we always step back and we look at um, Spalding's classification. And years ago, Dr. Spalding um, came, I think his name was Earl, Earl Spalding came up with a classification system. And I know that there's been some discussion about whether this should still be our classification system, but for today's um, presentation for all intents and purposes, we're going to roll with Earl's classification. So Earl decided that um, he would break these down into three categories. And critical sterilization um, involves instruments or items that penetrate bone and mucosa, and then scalers like dental hygiene, scalers, burrs, and chisels. And these are all items that should be sterilizable. And for instance, burrs, some are and some aren't. Some will uh, be single use only. And there are no diamond coated burrs right now in dental that have been approved for reuse. So most dental hygiene instruments and other dental instruments are definitely um, reusable and sterilizable, but some items aren't. So I want you to be thinking about um, that when you are out in practice, look at your instructions for use and see what that item really says, uh, how, how it should be reprocessed. And if it doesn't have instructions, then you should be tossing it. Um, Semi-critical instruments like the mirror, uh, things that contact the mucosa, they are listed for sterilization or high-level disinfection. Um, high-level disinfection really is not common in the dental realm. Um, and really, we always want to sterilize everything that we can, okay? So high-level disinfection, not too common, um, but sterilization is the standard. And then, of course, we have our low-level disinfectant uh, items, things like the x-ray tube head, the blood pressure cuff. So instrument processing is really key in breaking the chain of infection that happens and that can harm us. Um, and dental clinic protocols for this task should be written and should be um, distributed to all your team members because if there's no, um, if there are no guidelines, then people are not, your, your employees are not really going to always be sure what to do. So another poll question, the steps in instrument processing should have unidirectional flow. I went easy on you with this one, guys. Only two choices. <laughs> so I'll give you a few seconds to, to answer that. Okay. True. 100%. Excellent. I know that that seems like it should be a pretty obvious answer, right? Um, but in the dental realm, and, and when I say dental realm, I'm talking more dental private practice. Um, I know that there's dental settings within the community health care centers, um, et cetera, hospital-based settings. Um, so I'm not I'm not not nodding to those, but um, but private practice, community health care center, this is this is more of an issue because often the spaces that these centers, these instrument reprocessing areas are in have been reprocessed. I mean <laughs> have been reprocessed, have been repurposed. Um, it might literally be an old closet um, or an old lab, something that they have taken that space and they've now repurposed it. So with instrument processing, you know, we want to make sure that everything flows in one direction. And this is a very beautiful photo of um, a sterilization area uh, that has that unidirectional flow. Um, and because places like this don't always look like that, I, I just want to point out that you can actually use signage to guide you. Uh, clean, dirty, uh, something mounted there so your employees will know and be reminded. Um, 
So there's four key areas when you look at this particular photo. And to the left, you can see some um, holes in the counter underneath a red cabinet. This is where we're, we're receiving, cleaning, and decontaminating our instruments. Our next section is to the right of the sink where we're doing preparation and packaging. After that, you see the sterilizers. We've got sterilization and, and monitoring. And then that blue cabinet um, has to do with storage. So all of these steps have to be correctly performed every time. Um, and I will speak more to that as we progress. First things first, instrument cleaning um, and hand scrubbing um, are not always the first step in what we do. We're receiving cleaning and decontamination, but but that starts at that starts at the point of use. So out in the operatory, those instruments start to be prepared where we should be pre-treating them if they are going to sit or if that is your facility's policy or you are following some accreditation standards that say that that is a, uh, not an optional, it's a mandatory. So we uh, are pre-cleaning those instruments, so wiping off the gross debris, um, large bits of bio burden. Um, and in addition to pretreatment, there may be at times the need for holding solution. So instruments may need to be placed in a solution. And the, the reason for that is, of course, we don't want that bio burden drying on the instruments. Um, if that dries on the instruments, I know it shouldn't seem like it's that difficult to remove, but but we know it is. And we know that if we cannot remove all that debris and that bio burden, that you cannot sterilize that instrument. You cannot get through that and sterilize that instrument process uh, properly. So as far as transporting, we're gonna follow our standard operating procedure. We're going to be wearing all of our appropriate PPE, including utility gloves, because this is the point in time where we don't want to end up with a, a stick or a percutaneous injury, because we know those instruments are most likely contaminated, that they've been used. Um, and there's multiple different cleaning methods. So the first one you'll see in the slide, and then I'm going to talk about, is, is manual or hand scrubbing. Um, in, dent in dentistry, this can be pretty common. So we can't take, you know, at face value that we've got an ultrasonic cleaner or a washer disinfector. Um, and knowing that, it's really important to be able to do this task properly, okay? We wanna make sure that you are wearing your utility gloves while you're cleaning the instruments. And you should only be doing two or three at a time. Um, we want to scrub these instruments low in the sink under running water. And you see this photo, and I've got a, a brush that is, um, is mounted. It's not long-handled. And long-handled is really ideally, um, or the brush should have a wide surface. Um, we want to make sure that if your item that you're cleaning uh, discusses a particular method of cleaning or a particular type of brush or a particular type of, um, um, I would, I guess I would call these little, the ones in the middle brushes as well, but, um, but sometimes we're using, um, oh, sorry, I'm having a, I'm having a, a loss of term. <laughs> Anyways, I'll continue on, but you have to make sure basically that you are using the correct brush, um, the correct solution to wash it in, that you are using uh, utility gloves and working in a safe space. Uh, good lighting and magnification can be really important because when we take that instrument out and we think we've done our job, we need to look a little bit closer and make sure we've removed, removed all that. Um, in the blue bin, you see a brush and you can see some white material. This is from a facility that I went out to. Um, and a lot of times what I'm seeing is these items that have just been tossed. There. You should be cognizant of whether or not you sh should be using, and I know that um, the Joint Commission is, is very keen on this, is making sure you're using disposable brushes or brushes that can be sterilized appropriately. 
Um, as far as drying these instruments, um, we want to make sure that they're allowed to air dry or they are uh, pat, pat dried with, with lint-free toweling. Okay. So talking a little bit more, this is more common out in dental. Um, our instrument cleaning is often done with an ultrasonic cleaner. So you can see the largest photo there. Um, I, don't, I don't know how well you can see the white rings in that unit, but I will get back to that um, in a minute and, and we'll talk about the proper use of this, this tool. Um, the action that we're seeing with the ultrasonic is the detergent and sonic action, which is basically imploding bubbles. And those ultrasonic cleaners are breaking up and loosening the debris. So they are a nice way to get our instruments clean without putting ourselves at risk um, and streamlining the process. The important thing to know, back to that photo, is that we need to be using the manufacturer's instructions for use as a guide. We need to make sure that you are using the proper volume of water, the proper volume of solution, and that might be like a little hockey puck kind of a tablet, or it might be a liquid that you're adding, and that we're also using the cycle times, so the correct cycle time. Um, I was with a facility and the Joint Commission came in and specifically asked, you know, how much water did you put in this unit? How much solution did you put in this unit? And interestingly, what was the temperature of that water? So you may be needing to take the temperature of your water when you fill this unit, okay? Um, the reason why I have that large photo is because this facility left that solution in there um, for ages and they just kept using the solution again and again and again and this unit really should have the solution um, run filled fresh in the morning um, you need to make sure you run a degassing cycle to get all those larger bubbles out of the solution and then you will have um, you'll be ready to run for the day but if that solution is cloudy or um, full of debris, I mean, it really should be replaced. So if you have um, an office that uh, is doing root canal work, you know, I mean, they may not run this quite as often, but if you have a practice with um, eight hygienists, this, this unit will be running all day. And it's important that we know that it's, it's running correctly, and that's going to be with us doing a periodic test. So the ultrasonic will come with, you know, manufacturer's instructions for use, and they will tell you how to test this item, test this tool, test this equipment in order to make sure it's working properly. Um, you can see in the lower corner a piece of shiny foil. Um, there is a test called the foil test and there will be instructions for that in your unit. There are other products that are out there that you can use to test this unit, um, whether it be a little indicator strip or, a, or a, um, a glass vial with some solution in it, but making sure that you've got that unit working properly, you've got your solutions correct, you've got your instruments that are covered by the solution, because of course any instruments or cassettes that stick out of the solution, and, and I've seen this, um, will not get cleaned, and and that you're loading these uh, these items properly. Um, if you put too many instruments in there, too many cassettes in there, you might have an issue. There is a weight rating that should be recognized for these for these uh, for this type of equipment. Um, so that is something to consider, um, and you should always be using your your actual tray there because if you put instruments directly into the unit um, it will damage the unit so um, again once your instruments come out of here you are making sure that uh, they're air dried um, or pat dried with clean lint-free toweling um, so hand scrubbing can be what you're working on you may have an ultrasonic um, if you're if you're lucky in dental, and I know that this probably sounds really strange to the medical folks, um, you you'll have a because it's very commonplace. Um, 
an automated washer or washer disinfector out in dental is a really great piece of equipment to have. Um, so an instrument washer or a thermal disinfector looks very much like a dishwasher, but is actually needed to be a FDA cleared device. So one of these would be an FDA cleared device. You cannot go down to Best Buy, buy yourself a dishwasher and use that for instrument reprocessing. Uh, that is not uh, gonna get a thumbs up from any, anybody. Um, the higher temperature and the specific chemicals in this washer disinfector um, will not sterilize. They'll clean really, really well, but they will not sterilize. And for that reason, all critical and semi-critical items are still going to need to be packaged and sterilized. But the nice part of this unit is that the instruments often will come out dry and ready to go. So once they're dry, you open your cassette um, or you look at your instruments, make sure there's no debris left behind because if there's any debris left behind, you cannot appropriately sterilize. Um, and then you move on. So those are your three methods for cleaning your items. And again, if the items are not clean, you cannot sterilize them. So that is a really key point for sterility. In addition, prep and packaging is huge. Um, we wanna make sure that all those items are dry before they are packaged. And if they're not dry or they're not clean, they need to be recleaned or replaced. Um, packaging in dental often is a wrap for your cassette or a, a peel pack pouch. Um, we want to make sure that hinge instruments are open or disassembled because, of course, we want the steam, which is most commonly used in dental, not that we don't use other forms of sterilization, but steam being most common. We want that, that agent to be able to get into the nooks and crannies. Um, and we want to make sure that we are using an internal or an external indicator. So if we can't see in that wrapped item, we need to have an internal chemical indicator in there. And I'll talk more about that. But what's really key is that you're following your facilities protocol. Um, so focus on your facility protocol, make sure that you have the uh, packaging items that you need. Uh, different size pouches for different size items are important. Um, putting too many instruments in a pouch will not allow, again, that agent to uh, get in and do its job and sterilize the items. Um, and then as far as the blue wrap, which we typically use for cassettes, you want to make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions for use for that. It may be a double wrap or it may be one wrap that's already bonded together. So. Um, you, you can never go wrong by saying go back to the manufacturer's instructions for use. It's really important that you, whether it be for your dental handpiece, your ultrasonic cleaner, or your packaging, that you actually look at what the manufacturer says and how that item is properly used. And as you can see, uh, ANSI Amy ST79 here gives us guidance on that as well. So some of you might be saying, what in the heck is this? Documentation must be maintained for sterilizers. And that may mean the process of taking care of your sterilizer, the actual maintenance records or sterilization. Um, in dental, it's not as common to see a printer or a um, other device for recording your sterilization cycle. Um, in some cases, offices are using an item like this where they are listing the load details, what they put in the load, um, what's in the contents of their pouches, uh, if the steriliz sterilizer readings were met, what, you know, when we're focusing on temperature, time, and pressure. Um, and then if we've got our quality indicators that have been used, so have our chemical indicators changed, did we pass our biological, okay? So in some cases we see this, but um, it's very, very important 
as a best practice to really and and some guidance says that you have to have it in some case accreditation bodies say you have to have it um, but printers other ways to record that data as far as the how the sterilizer is running um, it, it it's really key it's a best practice i'm starting to see this more in dental dental offices are starting to get keen on this i know it seems like a really basic a basic thing but um it's not, believe it or not, it's not as common as we'd like it to be. So the ECRI Institute, um, they came out with a report in 2020, and it talked about the top 10 health technology hazards. And basically, this list identifies the things that they feel could be potential sources of um, danger and warrant considerable attention. So I was really surprised to see that number three on the list is sterilization. Um, so it says, while the prevalence of sterilization process failures is unknown, the potential exists for this to be an insidious, widespread patient safety risk. And we know this is the case. I have seen, um, you know, literature on this, discussions on this, uh, we all take at face value that uh, the instruments being used on us and our family during uh, dental treatment have been processed appropriately, um, but this was nonetheless interesting to see. So back to that document I was talking about, um, sterilization monitoring is a key element to making sure we have sterile instruments. And part of how we're doing this, uh, you know, Part of how we are determining our instruments are sterile at the you know at the end of the day um, is partly with physical monitors. So physical monitoring is basically us making sure that we're detecting gross error or gross malfunction. So sterilizers are monitored for time, temp, and pressure. Again, often in dental, I hate to even say this, we are not using a recording device. But Amy Ansi, ST79 2017, is very, very clear on this. It's a direct quote when I say, sterilizers that do not have recording devices should not be used, with the exception of sterilizers used together, used together with accessory recording devices or printouts. I don't know any office that has the ability to have a staff member in that reprocessing space looking at the sterilizer and watching those cycles. So yes, we need to know that the cycle ran correctly and we need to have proof of that, okay? So physical or also we call them mechanical monitoring um, is one of those steps. A big part of what we're looking at when we take those instruments, when we place them in and then we take them out sterile is our chemical indicators. So these indicators are telling us that one or more of the sterilizer parameters were met time, temp, or pressure. Um, and we can use a process indicator, which we would call a type one. There's actually type one to six. Um, and that's just your basic, you see it on the lower uh, left, your basic tape. Um, that would be something that changes color and just tells us, you know, this was exposed to the heat that the sterilizer provides. Um, so we, what we're seeing here is a visual confirmation that something's been exposed, but not the quality of the process. So we don't know that this was processed correctly. We just know that this item was exposed. Um, and then we have our chemical indicators, which are the types three, four, five, or six, and then they're internal, and we're using those every time. So the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC says, that these need to be placed inside a package and outside when an internal indicator is not visible from the outside. And then ANSI Amy says inside and outside, and they prefer the type five or type six internal chemical indicators. Okay. I won't talk about the others because those might be specific to a sterilizer, a specific sterilizer test, but we wanna be using our, um, our indicators. 
The last part of this is really key. And I'm gonna ask you this poll question. How frequently do you test your sterilizers with a bio biological indicator? Or of course, we refer to this as a spore test. So I'll give you about 15 seconds to think about that. Okay. All right, let's see what you had to say this morning. Daily, okay. I like that answer. I like that answer a lot. Um, typical to dental, we see once a week. Um, now, of course, if I was in the basement at the hospital processing instruments, it's with every load. But the more often we're testing, the more often we know that this process happened correctly. So moving forward, when we talk about biological indicators or BIs, you know, this is your routine test. Um, for, for those of you that have not necessarily done a, B, a BI, um, it, it typically, often I would say in dental, we're using indicator strips which get mailed out um, but there's also self-contained BIs that, that have a viable spore that's resistant to the type of sterilization that you're using. So if you're using steam sterilization, that bug would be Geobacillus sterothermophilus. Okay? Um, these self-contained BIs um, can be incubated in the office right away. So we know that we're getting those results quickly mail out tests or mail out indicator strips you know they may not they may not be coming back to us for a while and what typically what we typically see in that case is those instruments have already been released for use um, in a hospital setting until the bi comes back those items are not being released for reuse so so there's a big span between the two um the two settings i would say if the the BI spores are killed. We're assuming that the microorganisms, the bugs on the instruments are also killed. Um, and it has to be at least weekly or if the load contains an implant, okay? So in dental, we are not necessarily seeing every load BI or daily BI, but we really should be thinking about what is the best practice. Um, if we don't know that the sterilizer has failed and we've released those instruments, we may have put patients at harm and we are putting our reputation on the line. I think nobody in practice wants to harm our patients. Um, so more frequent testing really, uh, you know, I think should be key. Um, and in dental, I'm starting to see that more practices are doing that. Um, you know, private practices that, that are on their own and uh, practices that are under an accreditation body are, again, very, very different. So my last poll question for you. Most sterilizer failures are due to human error. True or false? Wanted to end an easy one. Wanted to end with an easy one. So let's see how you do. Okay. All right. I might have been too quick with this one, or you guys are thinking a little bit more deeply about it because I don't have an answer, believe it or not. So I guess you're off the hook. You must all be sipping your coffee. <laughs> Sterilizer failure is often tied to people. So if we are not, you know, if we are not properly loading the sterilizer, it will not work um, as it should. So, you know, in addition to the appropriate cleaning, you know, using our indicators, making sure we're monitoring the, the, the sterilizer itself, loading is key. So if you look at these two upper photos, you can see peel packs laying down. You can also see them standing up in a rack and you see those cassettes in the top, uh, the top rack. Those are both proper loading examples. The steam is going to be able to circulate around those instruments appropriately. Um, when we look at the lower left photo, we've got a pouch, we've got cassettes stacked on top, cassettes are not wrapped. Um, that's, 
that's an issue. Um, the middle, we've, we're not using the tray. It's right on the base of the, um, the unit. And then, of course, the others uh, to the right, those, those may be appropriate. But you need to look at your manufacturer's instructions for use for the unit. It will give you photos. It will give you guidance. Um, if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me if the plastic side of the pouch was up or the plastic side of the pouch was down, um, I'd be in Aruba right now. So make sure that you are looking at the instructions for use for your unit. I know there's one unit uh, that's commonly used in dental that it's the plastic side up on the pouch and then the other one that's more commonly used is the paper side up. Um, so follow those instructions for use. Make sure you are loading that unit. Uh, there is a weight limit as to how much or how many instruments should be in there. And you need to know this because if that agent um, that is being used to sterilize, in this case steam, if that cannot circulate around those instruments, get into that packaging, um, you are not going to be getting the result that you expect. And as I finish up my time with you, I want to talk about storage. Um, a lot of times we're not really thinking about storage. These instruments should be completely dry when they're coming out of the sterilizer, bone dry. If you are touching those instruments with hands, clean hands, as you're removing them, um, if the package is wet, you can still wick bacteria into those pouches. Um, so storage is really, really important. This is a healthcare system I went out and evaluated, and, um, and this is how they were storing their instruments. The risk here, uh, number one, what you can't see in the room is there's a, a chair, a patient, uh, a patient would be treated in this room, so a patient has access to these instruments. Um, but you know, importantly, they're all shoved in these particular holders. And what we're seeing is um, a very high risk of tearing the packaging, damaging the packaging. Now we've gone through all of the steps to get to the point where our instruments are sterilized. The last thing we wanna do is to be tearing um, the pouch um, and damaging the wrap to the cassette because then you start the process all over. Uh, the other issue here is, of course, it's exposed to the air if somebody's sneezing. Um, and then as the employee is shuffling these items through uh, to find the one that they want, if they want the nail lifter or the nails, you know, the nail clipper, um, they're shuffling those instruments or, or touching that packaging. So we really want to, after those instruments come out of the sterilizer, have as few touch points as possible. And that may mean that we take those instruments and we're bringing them to our sterile, you know, our sterile storage area. Um, what I have also seen out in private practice is instruments being stored like this. And so when I walked into this room, I see these mayo stands. And when I lift up the towel, here's these instruments. So although this may happen out in practice, once those instruments have been removed from their sterile packaging, they are not sterile any longer. They may be clean, but they may not be sterile. So in an ideal situation, we're really seeing that packaging is being opened in front of the patient. Now, of course, if it's a surgical situation, you know, they've got the OR um, has a protocol to keep things safe and clean. Um, and, and there's a whole process behind that. But we want to make sure that we're not storing instruments like this. So to wrap up, when I talk about sterile storage, again, cool, dry items being removed from the sterilizer. We want to keep them away from contamination. So we don't want a patient in the room sneezing on those pouches. Even though the outside of the pouch isn't sterile, we don't want to make, we want to make sure we're not cross-contaminating um, anything as we open the pouch. Closed, covered cabinets are an ideal situation. Of course, as few touch points as possible. Um, and we want to make sure that they're not ever really under a sink. 
Um, in the dental operatory, there is limited space and sometimes people store items under the sink, but that is not a place for our sterile instruments. Um, we want to examine those items, those packages for perforation. I have had students come out to a rotation with me and they have two sets of instruments and I've had both sets of instruments with perforated wrap and then we've gone back to the college for the day because those instruments are no longer sterile and we don't have more to use. Um, if a package is perforated, we want to make sure we're re-cleaning, repacking, and re-sterilizing. And then what your facility does with those sterile instruments, maybe uh, for storage, it may be time or event related. So instruments at one office, they may say, uh, you know, we will use those as long as the packaging is not damaged um, or perforated, or perhaps on December 31st, 2020, we go through all of our instruments and we sterilize them again. So from the point in time where we put our PPE on, hopefully safely, um, to that pretreatment that we're doing as we're in the operatory, all the way through instrument reprocessing, making sure our sterilizer is working properly because we know how to use it, because we um, are loading it correctly, because we're maintaining it correctly so it can do its job. And then down to storage, all of these are key items um, for how we make sure instruments are safe and uh, sterile for reuse. So in close, Sterilization is a really complex process and it relies on um, human and equipment factors. And we know humans are human, so we may not always be on point. Um, improperly or incompletely sterilized, sterilized items can be due to process errors. So we need to make sure we're doing all of the steps all of the time. Okay, so all steps have to be done correctly every time. If we fail in the cleaning stage because there's debris left behind, that instrument's not going to be sterile, even if we go through the entire process. And sterile dental instruments are key to providing safe care. We want to make sure that we provide the best care that we can um, because it's what we want to do. Um, but in addition, because Patients are smarter, they are wiser. And we know that out in the world, um, when something happens and we don't do it correctly, it gets into the media. So not only doing it safely because it's important to us, but making sure that we protect our, our reputation is important as well. So I have um, some resources for you after these question slides. And um, I, I want to point out that there are a number, you know, whether it be CDC or OSHA um, or uh, ANSI Amy, Amy ANSI or uh, OSAP, there's all sorts of guidance for us to look at. So my question to be to you would be is what questions might you have? Okay. All right, Joyce, thank you so much. And as a reminder to everyone, if you do have questions, you can feel free to submit those in the Q&A tool at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Um, Joyce, there is one question that I have for you. As someone who um, visits a dental facility, in general, yes. Um, what are some mm -hmm. key things that, as a patient, because we're we're all dental patients, right? Um, what are some key yeah, so things we that we can just that we can just pay attention to while we're there, as mm -hmm. you know, almost a way to do a quick audit. <laughs> I love that question, and I think it's really important. And I have had friends and family ask me. Um, my big first thing, and it sounds so basic, is to take a really good look around. When you enter that reception area, is it clean and tidy? You know, when you're at the front desk and you're talking to people, do you see hand sanitizer and Kleenex? But once we get into that actual clinical space, and I tell my students this because I teach in a hygiene program, is you need to sit in that patient chair. You need to take a look around. Look at the handles of the mirror, um, and the handles of the light. 
Are they clean? Um, look for dust bunnies in the corner. And when you enter that space, you know, are the instruments that are being prepared or, or being ready for you, are they on the tray in front of you? And are they open or are they still in their packaging? So your uh, your the person that's taking care of you, your practitioner, should not be walking around with their gloves touching your patient care gloves, touching cabinet drawers, touching um, door handles, and again, those instruments. If you walk in and those instruments have already been opened, um, I would be concerned. I want those instruments opened in front of me. Um, I do also see now that patients are saying, you know, can I go look at your sterilization area? If you said, you know, can you walk me by the sterilization area? That might be a glass window for you to look in, or they might make you, you know, they might allow you to peek in the doorway. But, you know, is that space clean and tidy? Or are they really, really reluctant to show it to you? So that is something that I think is really key. Um, there's a lot of a lot of parts to that equation, but I do uh, I do feel like you know just the first impression you get is is a good is a good place to start. So um, I have been asked a question, uh, Michelle, about implant kits. Implant kits need biological spore tests how often? Um, and then it sounds like the spore testing that they're doing is via mail. So she's asking about other options. Typically your dental implants that come into you will be sterile. They've been irradiated at the point of production. That's important to know. Um, but implant kits, if you are sterilizing an implant kit, you do need to sterilize it. Use a BI and you cannot release that item for use until the BI um, comes back and that you've passed. If you are only sending them in your testing via mail, um, that's fine if you're not going to use that implant for two weeks and you've gotten those results. But if you are waiting for those results um, and your patient needs to be treated and you use those items, that's not, that's not ideal. Uh, your other option is to do in-office BI, and you can buy a little incubator that sits on your counter, um, and you can run that BI with the implant and then get the results right there. And you can get results as quickly as 24 minutes. You can get one-hour results. You can get 24-hour results. So your facility will have to decide. But I personally like this option best because you know the answer before you release those items. And then you also know the answer in a in hopefully an actionable amount of time to pull other instruments out if there's an issue. So I hope that answers your question, Michelle. Um, Ashley had asked me, how do I handle a situation as a patient if I do see issues with cleanliness and sterile instruments? Um, I can tell you that I myself as a patient went in for procedure and I was sat in a chair and, um, you know, awaiting to go into, um, into the procedure. And on that chair was a big, long, dried drip of blood. Um, and I advocated for myself. I said, you know what, I need to be uh, moved. And, you know, this is obviously an issue. Um, if you have a concern about cleanliness and sterile instruments, if you say, you know, hey, that package was open on the tray, I'd like you to open the instruments in front of me, that is completely appropriate. Uh, you need to advocate for yourself. I would never suggest that you get up and you leave an appointment um, without giving someone a chance to uh, explain what and why they're doing. But if I saw an issue where I sat down in a, in a chair or I saw, um, you know, blood on a cabinet or I saw instruments that had been opened previously, I would, I would say, you know, very nicely, can you please get another set of instruments? I'm not comfortable with that. When they're open, they're not sterile. Okay. So sometimes it's, it's an awkward situation, but 
For sure, it's a concern. Um, I do want to touch upon a comment that was made by Jim on LinkedIn. Um, and Jim had talked about, and I know I addressed this, but Jim talked about the fact that facilities should really be using printers, using recording devices um, when they sterilize. And yes, I think that that is, um, is so very important. Um, I want to make sure that I don't, uh, I don't, you know, relay to you that that in dental uh, we get a pass on things. It it just is a different scenario. So hopefully, recording devices will become a standard. Um, and again, IFUs read those IFUs. Um, Ashley also asked, "Do I think dental technicians should be sterile processing certified?" I personally think that having a certificate program or a certification related to infection prevention or infection uh, control it should be really important and, and should be something that um, is, is addressed in dental. There is a new certificate and a new certification program coming out that is specifically for dental. It is the first one that I'm aware of. I have done the certificate. I'm waiting to do the certification when it's launched. Um, but I do think we need a higher level. There's so much stuffed in the curriculum, um, you know, that a lot of times it's, it's, it's very, it's a very quick look. So I would love to see a certification a certif or a certificate earned by dental, you know, professionals or technicians, anybody that's especially going to be in the sterilization area. Um, I think that that's key. And then I have one last question Thanks here. Oh, sorry. Siri wants to talk to us this morning. Uh, what do I think some of the most significant challenges that dental professionals face when performing dental instrument reprocessing? I think that it is um, usually a very small space that are, that's given. Um, and it's a process that has to happen very quickly in between patient care. So I do think that, um, you know, now we're seeing more central sterile areas uh, being done, and that would be my key. Not enough space, not enough time, and then in some cases, not enough equipment. You might need more instruments, you might need another sterilizer. So those would be, those would be, uh, would be key. So I want to say thank you very much for the time, right. and I do Joyce hope that if there's any questions that people will get those to me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I certainly want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for today's event and the sponsor for this first speaker, Joyce Moore, uh, 3M. So thank you to 3M. If you have any additional questions that we weren't able to get to, you can send those to Joyce via email. Her contact information is in the speaker bio uh, form on the right-hand side of your page. After this session, your screen will automatically transition you to the next session. But as a reminder, there's about a 15-minute break between each session throughout the conference today. Uh, if the registration page appears and you've already registered, please just click the already registered link, enter your email address, and you'll be able to enter the next session. We are so glad you're here. And Joyce, thank you once again for kicking off this conference for us. Thank you. My pleasure. Right. Enjoy the rest we'll of the day. We'll see everyone soon. Mm -hmm.